Hello everyone, it's currently Thursday, February 21st, 2013, and this is Day 9 Daily number 558, where we learn to be a better gamer. I am incredibly excited about this game. It was uh, played earlier today in the good studio, King of the Hill, and if you'd like to um, check that out live, go to twitch.tv slash vgdstudio, like T-H-E-G-D studio. Um, this was a game played between Gosu User of Team Millennium and Hasuabs of Team Mouse Sports. Zerg vs. Protoss on the new GSL map Atlas, so we're not only going to see a new map, but a whole bunch of new Heart of the Swarm strategies and a whole bunch of really crazy situations. In my eyes, this is the best game I have ever seen in Heart of the Swarm, ever, and I'm not what you know me. I like to say things are great, I, think, I like to say things are fantastic, but I don't speak in that superlative very often. I'm not one to say that it is the best game I've ever seen in a serious voice. Confirmation chat? Confirmation chat? We'll confirm soon. Mm. But uh, I'm really excited about this game analysis. So we'll be talking primarily about the map and how things sort of integrate at the start. And then in part two, we'll look at some of the mid-game decisions and in particular the new mid-game things that sort of unfold as a result of our new Heart of the Swarm units. Um, and when things wrap up near the end, we'll talk a lot about the uh, interesting decision-making with the replenishment of larva for the Zerg race, how they um, readjust their army, and also the expanding and craziness that's happening. Um, in other words, it'll be kind of a standard game analysis, but because everything is so new, we get a whole lot of treats today. I'm so thrilled. After this match will be the After Hours Gaming League Week 6 match between Intel and Epic. Both teams in the A-League currently 5-0 and zero going into Week 6. Who will become 6-0? and zero? It will be one of them because mathematically it's impossible for that not to be the case. Epic. 1HGL Season 2. Will they be able to do so again? Intel is in the way. So that'll be happening directly after this. Tomorrow, I'm going to be playing two indie games, Limbo and Journey, in the opposite order. Journey and then Limbo is actually what I'll be doing. So uh, hope to see you bright and early, 10 a.m. PST tomorrow, where I'll be playing for seven hours. Mm. Now, is there anything else that needs to be noted? No, other than that, I'm wearing a Walking Dead shirt in the comic books. Blam! Blowing his brains out. I think this shirt's awesome. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Zerg vs. Protoss on this map, DF Atlas. Heading right into things. Wow! Sean, you're having a swift introduction. What's going wrong today? Everything's going right, I should say. In the top left of Team Millennium, we have... <coughs> Excuse me. Gosu user who I think is fantastic. I think he is excellent. I, I honestly think that he's going to be one of these uh, people that certainly post-release of Heart of the Swarm be considered to be one of those tip-top North American Zergs right up there with um, the fine folks like Scarlet. And I totally, I'm totally happy to eat those words later, but given the way that Ghost User's been improving and what I've seen in his matches, I think he's amazing. Uh, 3 owing MVP in Iron Squid is not easy, and he did it. <laughs> cool. Um, uh, so yeah, he was on Team Complexity, so this is kind of the awesome Millennium Complexity Gosu user. Yes, Gosu user in the top. By the way, the W, you can think of as two U's. So that's not Goswisser, it's Gosu user. Cool. Down in the bottom left, one of my favorite players from Team Mouse Sports is Hasu Abs. Um, a little bit about their styles. Gosu User is known for having a solid straight up game. I think most notably, as we saw in the Iron Squid, just playing brilliantly straight up. MVP did play a little bit beneath his usual skill level that day, but Gosu User was playing fantastically, even if MVP was in like fine form. I think the Ghost User still could have very very well taken that game. But Ghost User is very well known for having some extremely crazy openings that he's willing to do just sort of on a dime. Hasuabs uh, is very much so a more defensive-ish player. Um, excellent at holding strong, excellent um, 
mid and late game especially. He's excellent at doing things like planting pylons along here, all this sort of thing. You'll regularly see Hasuabs do amazing split offs from his army in mid and late game to harass expansions that would be up here or expansions down here. So now we have a little bit about their styles and we haven't done I think something that many of you are asking about as I can see there into chat. I want to talk a little bit about the map so I have it loaded up here in the amazing Team Liquid wiki. For any of you who have never used uh, Liquipedia, just go to wiki.teamliquid.net and you get like all the information that you'd ever want about any tournament. Like seriously, look at MLG Winter Championships. You can see like all the data and the breakdown of everything. Actually, let me just, where's, a, where's another good one? Let me just go to Iron Squid. Like, you just get these incredible, nice, beautiful diagrams written out of everything that went on in clear, concise format, the racial breakdown, all that good stuff. So, of course, found this photo of the map Atlas, which has its very own page. Yeah. Um, so here it is. It's a four-player map. So there's one, two, and three, four. I actually zoomed in quite a bit. I actually will zoom in a little bit more with my wonderful control key, just so we can get a sense of what the bases look like. I want to start up here in the top left corner, and we'll just do our analysis from there. We have a natural expansion that I don't think is particularly notable. It has a relatively wide entrance. So immediately we have some mild concerns about um, some big all-ins. We don't want to cut too many corners on a map like Shakura's Plateau. We could cut those corners because we have the ramp. Uh, on a map like um, Antigua Shipyard, where we have a ramp, or Ohana, where we have a ramp, we can cut a few more corners. We don't want to cut quite as many corners as a Protoss player, uh, for instance, there. Also, uh, in terms of third bases, we actually have, whoops, we have two options. We can go southward a little bit to this base here, which kind of has this unusual formation. We have a center spot that can move up to this third, or these destructible rocks can be taken out, creating another access point to the third. Likewise, we could do this other location for a third base, which would guarantee that we have one, two ramps that we need to cover. Um, in honesty, I think that from the Protoss point of view, this is the better expansion because we need to basically wall this off in order to secure this expansion, so it's actually quite comfortable. Um, and in terms of taking a fourth, even though this is close, this is still a very reasonable choice for a fourth. Given that, you know, we wall this off and we sort of work our way down that. Zerg, I'm, I'm torn between saying that this expansion or this, or, or excuse me, or this as a third is better. If you look at it, this expansion is a little easier to join with creep in that regard. But this expansion is a little bit easier to manage pylons because we have exactly one, two, three places we need to cover and this whole high ground area we're guaranteed to have an essential lockdown. I'd still probably say that I like this one a little bit better as a third base. And thirds, of course, are the most important aspect to any strategy. Period. Third bases define every team. Can we get our uh, bases earlier on? But I want to talk a little bit about those um, just because, you know, if we uh, start moving down here and start moving southward, there's a lot of counterattack paths. There's actually lots and lots of counterattack paths once these rocks are taken out. These rocks create interesting constrictions where it's easy to counterattack but hard to flank given the fact that it's such tiny spaces. A lot easier to, um, a lot easier to assault. Um, in wide open spaces for Zerg, not so nice in here. So we'll be talking a little bit about those as this game goes on. So without any further ado, I want to get underway. Because we have quite a lot of game to cover. In this game, I want to talk quite a bit more from Gosu User's point of view. Um, not only because I think that he he is the, the Zerg man, he's one of my favorite Zerg players to watch right now, uh, but also because I just want to do a little more coverage of Heart of the Swarm Zerg because I think, I think I'm just going to, I think it's time to be blunt. Zergs have been struggling a lot in HOTS. I will absolutely not argue that Zerg are super weak in HOTS or any of that stuff. Um, I, I will say, however, that for Protoss, Skytoss, 
instantly makes sense. Like the third time I went all sky toss, it went pretty easily. Mech, a little bit harder, still pretty easy. Zerg using Swarm Hosts and Vipers has turned out to be quite difficult to sort of figure out how they work. I've had games where I crush people with Swarm Hosts and games where I get absolutely mauled because I can't defend freaking anything with Swarm Hosts. So, um, a Ghost User in this game, I think, is, is going to give us the treat of insight on how to do a lot of those mid-game thingies. Um, and also, it, it's going to be quite unique. Uh, some of these decisions. So this game is going to be dripping with all sorts of interesting points to analyze. 14 pool, not interesting. 13 gate and main base, how interesting! Oh, unless it's Naniwa, we really don't see Protoss players do this in Wall, or I should say Wings of Liberty, but in the heart of the swarm, we do. So this is now something that um, I would say most newer Zergs, especially who are hanging out in Plat and Lower, even Diamond and Master Zerg, to be honest, many have no clue what to do in this circumstance at all. So I actually want to go to the Gosu user cam and note something that I find very, very interesting. Getting an early gas is very, very important against someone who goes one base fast gate really important because if he's getting a fast cybernetics core we really do need the speed zerglings to deal with the warp gate units and more importantly the warp in pylons we can pick those off but we're seeing ghost user just do it straight up kind of surprising interesting to say the least there's the puke and the move down and the advancement so we certainly want to get some information, some data on what's up. Zergling, you'll notice just general good mechanics, moving just barely up the ramp and then pulling back instantly, not doing any sort of excessive double scout with this overlord. And then upon seeing this and the no base, we really do know what's up. We really know precisely what's up. Whoops. <laughs> Dang it. Dang it, I accidentally disabled the sounds like a dunsass. Like a silly dunsass. Now, Ghost User is immediately going to do something that I think is sort of contrary to the modern Zerg technique, which is to just go a lot of queens early on. Almost all players um, who are in autopilot will be taking this third now, will be building another queen. But Ghost User doing some smartness. He's going to lose these lengths but he replenishes just a tiny number of them. Not a tremendous amount. We're gonna get 10 links total, six there, four there, to be able to just do some prodding, some poking, and then an instant layer. Now this is the weird part, instant layer, one gas, two gas, three gas, right when the layer starts flooding with gas. Now in terms of the uh, different kinds of pushes that can come at us, our opponent can be going for one Zealot, one Stalker, and Mothership Core, which actually would have hit by now. He can be going one Zealot, one Stalker, or excuse me, one Zealot, two Stalkers, Mothership Core. So this, this force is our defensive setup. By the way, a Queen can actually take down a Mothership Core one-on-one. -on -one. So, um, um, so this is, this is somewhat defensive, but because we're getting Zergling speed here as well, this is to shove back. This shove back coordinates very nicely with our getting of the layer. We don't ever want to get layer unless we're either building spines for defense or sending out links for offense. And now it's time to do the most important thing to do in all of StarCraft, which is to list off the possibilities that our opponent can be doing and make sure that we have them all accounted for. Our opponent could be going for big gateway pushes to follow up. These will help spot these en route. He could be going for something defensive like sentries and some sort of robotech. We would almost always expect to see gateways at the front, so cool, we're getting our scouting information. He could be going Stargate, could be going Twilight Council. I want to break these up into simple partitions. Um, for any of you who don't do this, do this. List out all the possible things that he can do and just group them into logical groups. Um, and you group them um, into things that are thematically consistent. Um, there you go. 
So for instance, I'm talking about Twilight Council, Robo, Stargate, um, Gateway Pressure, maybe he can be going for a fast third. There's all sort of different things, but let's group them. He's either attacking us now and screwing his tech over later, or he's not going to attack us now and he's going to be doing something cute and techy later. So that would be Stargate, Robo pushes, Twilight pushes, are all in this category. And also the we need to make sure we don't die right now is in this one. And I put these into these separate categories because like the er the pushes, all the early stuff is like eight to nine minutes-ish. It's the stuff that comes early. All the cute, techy, terrifying aggression, like six gate blink stalker, six gate with robo pushes, even five gate with robo skipping, twilight, all that stuff, it's gonna come later, like 10, 11, 12, something like that. So we actually can just divide these into two logical groups. Um, and this is something that players do constantly. They just partition, partition, partition. So that way, you know, they can say things like, well, I'm gonna go a bunch of queens right now because he's either gonna attack me with air, so I have the queens for it, or he's gonna go into long-term macro and my queens will be getting me larva and creep spread. So it's the same solution for everything in the group. Nice, nice, nice. So we're seeing this, and Gosu user, I think, is doing something hyper-modern that's very brilliant. First of all, the lings to control the space, and very fast spire tech. Now, actually, comparatively, I want to just come back to 550, and um, note that this is a before six-minute layer. This is fast as hell! This is just so dang fast. This is about 90 seconds before your average three basing layer. Um, super good. Um, my coder saying something weird, like everything sounds okay. I don't know what just happened with my encoder. I'm sorry, I just wanted to make sure everything's everything's good. Uh, okay, everything sounds good. Sorry, I don't know. My encoder's audio thing was like... I was like, <gasps> but I know I'm talking. So, all right. Apologies for that delay. But this is very clever. If he's going for, I want you to note this timing, 100 seconds. So this means that this will be done at around 9 minutes. How long does it take for Mutalisks to pop out? Mutalisks take about 30 seconds. So at about, uh, at about 9.30, we'll have Mutalisks out on the field. At about 9.30, we'll have Mutalisks out on the field. So what this means is that if he's going for Blink Tech or Robo or some delayed techy type thing, this Spire will contain him. We'll get him totally locked down. We don't need to worry at all about that. This is a smart scout by Haswabs and an even smarter answer from there. Why are we throwing down this hatch right now? Because we are getting signals from our opponent. Right about now, he should have been moving out. Were there going to be one of those eight or nine minute timings? Actually, hell, let me, I actually should be pedantic about that. Uh, I think I might need to back up just a little bit and back up a little bit and okay. No, Jesus, not six minutes. Replay, what? What's wrong with you, replay? Oh no, please don't tell me I have to do this. Oh, technology, oh my god. Oh, rewinding in 10 second increments. The technology is clearly not there yet. That's fine, I'll be mega pedantic. So, once again, partition one, early aggression. That's a whole category of things we need to worry about. Category two, delayed aggression because he's doing tech. That's all I want to say about that. I'm worried about an attack. I'm worried about an attack. Is his attack coming? It could be coming right now. I'm starting to get suspicious that he's not attacking because I'm not seeing anything because it would strike at 8.15 to 9 minutes. I'm seeing nothing. Let me move forward, huh? I'm still seeing nothing move out. I'm seeing nothing. Nothing's going on. Okay, nothing's going on. Then I guess he is actually going for a tech play. Therefore, I will expand. So... This is what I call a non-trigger, because nothing happened. I can conclude he is not doing this whole partition of aggression. It must be something more tech-focused. 
cool. Very standard, happens all the time. You'll often see pros do this, and it looks like that's the build they're following, but it's not quite. Had Gosu user seen a whole bunch of stuff moving out, he would have seen it at 715, and he would not have built this hatch. So I was talking a, a little swift there, but that was fun. <laughs> I liked it. So this Spire is very much so going to contain our opponent. We're going to use a low amount of air units and a high amount of drones to do our next transitional step. So we're a little concerned. What sort of push will he be doing? Is this getting under attack? Uh, I'm actually going to go to the Gosu or the Hasuab's cam. Well, Hasuabs has seen this, which is fine. It's not essential that we hide it. But then this takes uh, an interesting turn. Ghost user is going to scout in. What is he looking for? Well, within the partition, it's either Robo, Twilight, or Stargate. That's it. Those are the only two possibilities. And we see Stargate. I will note something right now. In Ghost of User's Money, look at this fantastic setup. 54 drones. We're ahead in the drone count, despite being two base. We have some larvae. I want you to just appreciate this moment. Look at this. It's about to pop off. Look at the look at the larva inject. It's three seconds from popping off. Look at this larva inject. It's a little bit slower, but it's about eight, ten seconds from popping off. Look at the money. Instantly we'll be able to build ten. And look at his supply, 65 of 100. What a magnificent coordination of all these various pieces. However, he sees the Stargate. He sees a relatively high Phoenix count. Phoenixes really crush the Mutalisks. And Gosu user does a real interesting move. Hydralisk den and no Mutalisks whatsoever. Spine crawler, spine crawler. This is almost finished and 16 drones suddenly get made. I will honestly note that this is one of the most, this is a difficult technical opening to open with the Spire. And then upon seeing Hasuab's um, with this Stargate play, immediately says, okay, you opened one gate, expand, and then walled in with gates, and now you're going Phoenix, it means you will dominate the air and you will suck in all other regards. So building these drones, I am completely 100% safe against that. Weird transition, perfect. Really excellent. Um, there's some other alternatives um, that people have argued that are, are, are strong, such as going for Mass Corruptor uh, in, that, in that spot as well. Uh, I think that I like this a lot more, especially given the new benefits of the Hydralisk. So um, for the record, these players are like top 20 Grandmaster HOTS players and some of the most um, infamous pros in the game. So this is really daring to see um, both of them doing these cool openings. So when we come back in part two, we've done some notes of what can go on in the uh, in the opening, just some of the weirdnesses of Ghost of User's play, but also why it's, why it's so clear given the circumstances. And then in part two, when we come back, we're going to be considering a little bit more of, again, what are the possibilities that Prodox can hurl at us? And how are we as the Zerg user, Gosu user, going to exploit the new Hydralis to our benefit? Ha! Watcha, watcha. Man, I'm so happy. All right, let's take a break. Be back in three minutes.